Reading through the Bible in one year, February 23rd, Exodus chapter 6, Luke chapter 8, Job 23, and 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Then Yahweh said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh, for by a strong hand he will let them go, and by a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. God spoke further to Moses and said to him, I am Yahweh. And I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, again, name here not being just Yahweh or Jehovah, whatever you say out loud. Remember, Yahweh means, uh, not Yahweh, name in this text. What does it mean? It means the character and nature, the representation of who God is, right? By my character, by my nature, by my representation of who I am, Yahweh, I was not known to them. He just spoke to them, but he didn't show them in power. And I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they sojourned. Furthermore, I have heard the groaning of the sons of Israel because the Egyptians are holding them in slavery. And I have remembered my covenant. So, say therefore to the sons of Israel, I am Yahweh, and I will bring you out from under the hard labors of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from under slavery, or rather from under their slavery. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. So what are the things they have to do to earn this? Nothing. God's going to do this for them. Then I will take you for my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am Yahweh, your God, who brought you out from under the hard labors of the Egyptians. And I will bring you out to the land which I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And I will give it to you for a possession. I am Yahweh. So Moses spoke thus to the sons of Israel. But they did not listen to Moses on account of their weakness of spirit and their hard slavery. Now Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Come, tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the sons of Israel go out of his land. And Moses spoke before Yahweh, saying, Behold, the sons of Israel have not listened to me. How then will Pharaoh listen to me? For I am of uncircumcised lips. Then Yahweh spoke to Moses and to Aaron and gave them... And gave them a command for the sons of Israel and for Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the sons of Israel out of the land of Egypt. These are the heads of their father's households, the son of Reuben, Israel's firstborn, Hanok and Palu, Hezron and Carmi. These are the sons, uh, rather, these are the families of, of Reuben. The sons of Simeon, Jemuel and Jamin and Ohad and Jachin, and Zohar and Shaul, the son of a Canaanite woman. These are the families of Simeon. These are the names of the sons of Levi according to their generations. Gershon and Kohath and Merari. And the years of Levi's life were 137 years. The sons of Gershon, Libni, sorry, Libni and Shimei, or Shimei, according to their families. The sons of Kohath, Amram and Izhar and, Heb and Hebron and Uziel. And the years of Kohath's life were 133 years. And the sons of Merari, uh, Mali and Mushi. These are the families of the Levites according to their generations. And Amram took his father's uh, sister, Jochebed, as a wife, and she bore him Aaron and Moses. And the years of Amram's life were 137 years. The sons of Izhar, Korah and Nepheg and Zikri, or Zikri. The sons of Uziel, Mashael and, I and Elzaphan and Sithri. And Aaron took Ele, uh, sorry, Elisheba, sorry, Elisheba, there we go, the daughter of Aminadab, the sister of Nashon, as a wife. And she bore him Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar, the sons of Korah, Asir and Elkanah and uh, Abiasaph. These are the families of the Korahites. And Aaron's son, Eleazar, took one of the daughters of Putiel as a wife, and she bore him Phinehas. These are the heads of the fathers' households of the Levites, according to their families. 
It was the same Aaron and Moses to whom Yahweh had said, Bring out the sons of Israel from the land of Egypt according to their hosts. This is their large number or armies. They were the ones who spoke to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring out the sons of Israel from Egypt. It was the same Moses and Aaron. Now it happened on the day when, uh, when Yahweh spoke to Moses in the land of Egypt, that Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, I am Yahweh. Speak to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, all that I am speaking to you. But Moses said before Yahweh, Behold, I am of uncircumcised lips. How then will Pharaoh listen to me? And that's all the notes up to here. Let's move on to Luke chapter 9. And calling the twelve together, he gave them power and authority over all the demons and to heal diseases. And he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he said to them, Take nothing for your journey, neither a staff, nor a bag, nor bread, nor money, nor have two tunics apiece. And whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that city. And as for those who do not receive you, as you go out from that city, shake the dust off of your feet as a testimony against them as then you don't want even the dust of their city clinging to you. And departing, they went out, rather, they were going throughout the villages, proclaiming the gospel and healing everywhere. Now Herod the Tetrarch heard of all that was happening, and he was greatly perplexed because it was said by some that John had risen from the dead, this is John the Baptist, and by some that Elijah had appeared, and by others that one of the prophets of old had arisen. And Herod said, I myself had John beheaded, but who is this man about whom I hear such things? And he kept trying to see him. When all the apostles returned, they recounted to Jesus all that they had done, and taking them with him, he slipped away by himself to a city called Bethsaida. But when the crowds became aware of this, they followed him, and welcoming him, he began to... Uh, Rather, he began speaking to them about the kingdom of God in curing those who had need of healing. Now, the day was ending, and the twelve came to him and said to him, Send the crowd away that they may go into the surrounding villages and countryside and obtain lodging and find provisions, for here we are in a desolate place. But Jesus said to them, No, you give them something to eat. They said, We have more than, no more than five loaves and two fish. Unless perhaps we go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men, not including the women and children. And Jesus said to his disciples, Have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. And they did so and had them all sit down. Then he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed them. And he broke them and kept giving them to the disciples to set before the crowd. And they all late were satisfied. And the broken pieces which they had left over were picked up, twelve baskets full. And it happened that while he was praying alone, the disciples were with him. And he questioned them, saying, Who is it that the crowds say that I am? They answered and said, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, but others that one of the prophets of old has arisen again. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said, The Christ of God. But he warned them and directed them not to tell this to anyone, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. And he was saying to them all, If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Again, we have this today. It's just a, a standard message. Oh, I... Oh, When I park my car at the Whole Foods, I worry every time that someone might see my Jesus fish on the back and scratch my car, because those are godless people. But I'm just carrying my cross. No. To these people, carrying your cross literally meant carrying the means of your humiliation and torturous death. That awaits you. 
We don't really have anything today that could directly equate with it. But take your electric chair with you. It's a death, but it's not necessarily a humiliating one. This is what was happening. It's, it's, it's a horrific thing. It's a horrific image for them to see. Every time they would walk into large cities, they would see people hung up, uh, sorry, hung and, and crucified to death, stripped naked, often beaten, and left out for everyone to see as an example. It's a horrible view to even to even imagine today, much less the the, the imagery that Jesus is portraying to them. You must take up your cross daily. You must carry it with you, understanding that this could very well be the end result for you if you follow after me. He's literally telling them the truth. He's warning them that the Christian life it's not cupcakes and rainbows, right? The, the, the health and wealth preacher may as well be completely lost on this idea because their idea of salvation from God is that God has to give you whatever you ask for. What is it that Paula White said? Big mouths get big rewards. Those who command God to do things, I declare God must do this and give me what is the desire of my heart. It's never that they're declaring that God would strip them of who they are, strip them of their desires, strip them of, of, of their, their, their plans for themselves so that they might serve God appropriately. It's never that. It's always that they might be glorified, that they might be the ones to be praised and not God. But what is Jesus telling his disciples here? You've just rightly confessed that I am the Christ of God, and I'm going to go and I'm going to be tortured, and I'm going to go and be judged by the people I created, and I'm going to be killed by them. And then he says, if any of you wish to follow after me, if any of you want to also become a disciple of mine, know that most likely a torturous death awaits you. All but one of his disciples died in a, in a violent way. He's telling them, you need, to, you need to throw away this idea that everything is going to be great for you. Why? Because if you come to Christ in order to enhance your own life, in order to, to make your life better, you're coming to Christ for the wrong reason. He demands everything. He demands all that you are, all that you have. If God so desires to have everything in your bank account, you need to dump it. If you've been saving up for, for 20 years to get this beautiful boat, right? God may re require you to empty that bank account to send missionaries all over the world. I'm not going to say he's going to do that, but he might. I'm certainly not going to tell you to do that. But if that's what God leads you to do on your own, then that's what God calls you to do. And you'll know when he calls you to do it. it won't be some guy in a television asking you to send in a, a seed so you can get a prayer cloth. Jesus demands everything. Because for us, he gave up everything. So this is what he's saying. 
And he was saying to them all, all of his disciples, everybody who was there, if anyone wishes to come after me, to follow me, to become a disciple of mine, let him deny everything that he is and take up his, his, the method of his coming destruction. Let him take that up with him. Daily. Remember that daily and then follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life, the life you have today, you will lose it. But whoever loses it for my sake, for the sake of Christ, for Christ's mission in the world, he is the one who will save it. For what does what a man profit it if he gains the whole world? And loses or forfeits himself. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory, in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I say to you truthfully, there are some of those standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Six days later, or rather, Now it happened some eight days after these words that he was taking along Peter and John and James and he went up on the mountain to pray. And it happened that while he was praying, the appearance of his face became different and his clothing became white and gleaming. And behold, two men were talking with him and they were Moses representing the law and Elijah representing the prophets who, appearing in glory, were speaking of his departure, which he was about to fulfill at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions had become, sorry, had been overcome with sleep, but when they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. And it happened that uh, as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three booths, or tents, or tabernacles, uh, one for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not realizing what he was saying. Bringing up the notes, we're almost there. While he was saying this, a cloud formed and began to overshadow them. And they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. They kept silent and reported to no one in those days any of the things which they had seen. Now it happened on the next day that when they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met him. And behold, a man from the crowd shouted, A a teacher! I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only one. And behold, a spirit seizes him, and and suddenly he screams, and it throws him into convulsions, with foaming at the mouth. And only with difficulty does it leave him, mauling him as it leaves. And I begged your disciples to cast it out, and they could not. And Jesus answered and said, You unbelieving and perverse generation, how long will I be with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. Now while he was approaching, or still approaching, the demon slammed him to the ground and threw him into into convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the demon, or the unclean spirit, and healed the boy and gave him back to his father. And they were all astonished at the majesty of God. But while everyone was marveling at all that he was doing, he said to his disciples, Put these words in your ears. Again, while everybody's celebrating Jesus the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand this statement, and it was concealed from them so that they did not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this statement. Now an argument started among them as to which of them might be the greatest. Again, they expect Jesus to be the Christ, right? The Christ of God, uh, the, the, the Messiah who is to come into the world. And from everything that they had been taught, They'd only been taught about what was going to happen at Jesus' second coming. Now, to be clear, the text isn't really clear as to what's going to happen when. But 
they thought that Jesus was going to come in as this conquering king. You've heard me say this before. Where he's going to overthrow the Roman and the Greeks and all of these other governments and lift up the Israelite people to the pinnacle of civilization and let them rule over all the people finally getting back at all the people who had wronged them this whole time. So these people, these followers of his, are expecting Jesus to come in as this conquering king. And so all of them are clamoring as to which of them might be the vice president of the new Jerusalem. Right? That's what they're, that's what they're trying to find out here. But Jesus, knowing that what they were thinking in their heart, He took a child and stood him by his side. And he said to them, Whoever receives this child in my name receives me. Whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For the one who is least among you, this is the one who is great. And John answered and said, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to hinder him because he does not follow along with us. Like, ha, teach that guy. But Jesus said to him, no, do not hinder him. For he who is not against you is for you. Now it happened that when the days for him to be taken up were soon to be fulfilled, he set his face, as in he set his purpose, to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead of him, and they went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for him. But they did not receive him because he was journeying with his face set toward Jerusalem. They wanted him to stay for a long time, and they were like, wait, what what do you mean, he's only going to be here the night? No, get out of here. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command for fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Now, we're finally at one of these bracketed sections again. We haven't had one in a while. Again, remember that the bracketed section itself just means that it's a piece of the text that seems to be um, a scribal note or perhaps something else, right, that was um, accidentally copied into the text and just kind of became expected to be there over time. It doesn't change anything. It doesn't say Jesus told us to worship llamas or anything like that. But it is interesting to see it. It's left in the text. So first, I'm going to read this without it there, just move to the end of verse 56. And then I'm going to read it with it there, just so you know what's kind of expected. So first, without the text. But he turned and rebuked them, and they went on to another village. Now, with this disputed text. But he turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know of what kind of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went on to another village. That's it. So when you see things like this, just don't build a ministry around it. All right, continuing on, verse 57. And as they were going along down the road, someone said to him, I I will follow you wherever you will go. And Jesus said to him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Again, this is someone else who's expecting Jesus to be this great conquering king, and they're expecting to get some sort of value from it. And he's telling him, look, man, I have nothing to offer you. And he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, will first permit me to go and bury my father. But Jesus, in his way, starting with the earthly and taking it to the spiritual, said, Allow the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Another also said, I I will follow you, Lord, but first permit me to say farewell to those at home. And Jesus said to them, or said to him, No one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. I'm going to read the note on this one because this one gets weird for some people. Bring up that note because there's, again, a lot in this area. Here's the note on verse 62. 
Anyone who puts his hand to the plow has to keep looking forward to guide the plow. For if he looks back, the plow will quickly veer off course. This isn't saying someone who starts off on their journey and just looks back longingly and remembers how things used to be, but is glad for where it's going now. He's saying, you got to keep focused on what you're doing. And that's it. Move on now to Job 23. Then Job answered Eliphaz the Temanite, his friend, the same friend who just accused him of a laundry list of things, trying to goad him into admitting some sort of guilt. And Job answered and said, Even today my musing is rebellion. His hand is heavy despite my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him. Talking about God. That I might come to his seat. I would arrange my case for justice before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would know the words which he would answer and, and, and discerning, rather, and discern what he would say to me. Would he contend with me by the greatness of his power? No, surely he would pay attention to me. There the upright would argue with him, and I would have escaped forever from my judge. Behold, I go forward, but he is not there, and backward, but I cannot discern him. When he acts on the left, I cannot behold him, and when he turns on the right, I cannot see him. But he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. My foot has held fast to his path. I have kept his way and not turned aside. I have not departed from the command of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my uh, portion of food. But he is unique, and who can turn to him? Rather, who can turn him? And what his soul desires, that he does. For he performs what is a portion for me. And many such decrees are with him. Therefore, I would be dismayed at his presence. I carefully consider and am in, and am in dread of him. It is God who has made my heart faint, and the Almighty who has dismayed me. But I am not silenced by the darkness, nor thick darkness which covers me. He goes into more of this tomorrow. Let's conclude today in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Paul continues now. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud. This in the, there was, uh, we'll get to that in a little bit as we're reading through Exodus. But um, God provided for the people a cloud of covering to stop them from getting burned in the day as they walked. He provided a pillar of fire at night to lead the people or as you and I might call it, a tornado of fire to also protect them. Sure as heck kept everybody away from them. Our fathers were all under this cloud, under the blessing of God, and all passed through the, uh, passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food, all drank the same spiritual drink, for they were all drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. I'm going to read the note on this, because there's a lot of Catholics I know who get hung up on this. We're going to read from the Reformation Study Bible this time. God is often compared with a rock, and Israel, called Jeshurun, is described as having forsaken God, the rock of his salvation. The Lord identified himself in a special way with the rock that gave forth water both at Massa and Meribah. For he stood before, the, uh, before Moses on the rock as it was struck. That's what he told Moses to do. He told Moses, I will stand in front of the rock and I want you to strike it. And other people could see that God was there. But he told Moses that he would be there. So it's not just that he's striking a rock 
but that he's striking through God, attacking God to get the water to come out of the rock, showing that he's going to give forth this, this life-giving water for them. The analogy between the Israelites and the Corinthians is not an arbitrary illustration. There's a theological connection. So Paul identifies the rock as a type of Christ. Without minimizing the privileges enjoyed by Christians, Paul reminds us that the deliverer of the Israelites was none other than our crucified and risen Savior. That's why he says this. It's important. But that doesn't mean that you should worship a rock. Continuing on. Verse 5. Nevertheless, with most of them, with most of the people, that, the ones who followed, God was not well pleased with them. For they were struck down in the wilderness, all but two. Moses was not spared. Now, these things happened as examples for us, so that we would not crave evil things as they also craved. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were. As, is, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us act in sexual immorality, as some of them did. And 23,000 people fell or died in a single day. Nor let us put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the serpents. Nor grumble, as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction, upon whom the ends of the ages have now finally arrived. Therefore, let him who thinks that he stands, as in stands in his own authority or knowledge of God, take heed that he does not fall. No temptation has overtaken you, but as such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you won't be able to endure it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to prudent people, you judge what I say. Is not the cup of blessing, which we bless in the sharing of the blood of Christ, is not the bread which we break as a sharing of the body of Christ? Since there is one bread, and we, who are many, are one body, for we all partake of the one bread, this is the Christ, look at the nation of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices sharers in the altar? What do I mean then? That a thing sacrificed to idols is anything? Or that an idol is anything? No, but I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to, to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to become sharers in demons. He's saying, look, the food that they offer to these idols, it's not a real God or anything, but they're sacrificing it to demons, which to them, they believe it's a God. And to them, they believe that there's power associated with that, though it's just demonic power. Again, all in control by the actual God and king of the universe. But if people believe that you are serving with these people, right? The people believe that you are serving with these um, idols. Then you're running a risk of violating the law of God if you lead people astray. If you have brothers and sisters who fall into sin because of this, that's the point that he's making. Verse 21 here. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Back to this thing that they had originally said. All things are lawful. Yes, but not all things are profitable. Well, all things are lawful. Yes, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but that of the other person. 
Eat anything that is sold in the meat market without asking questions for conscience sake, both for your conscience, so you don't have to worry about it, and also for the conscience sake of the person who's selling it to you, right? Because that way, if you just find meat in the market and you buy it and you don't know that it was sacrificed to some god or goddess or anything else, and you don't have to worry about it. Meat's meat, right? For the earth is the Lord's, as well as its fullness. Everything belongs to God. If one of the unbelievers invites you, right? So again, somebody who isn't a Christian, might be Jewish, might be pagan, might actually be an atheist, nobody knows. And you want to go, well, eat anything that is set before you without asking questions for conscience's sake. Right? That way you don't know what it was sacrificed to. It doesn't matter to you. You don't care. But if they come up to you and they say, oh, well, there's sextra blessing in this, you go, yeah, me, hey, thanks. But if anyone says to you, well, this meat is, is consecrated to idols, do not eat it. For the sake of the one who informed you, and for conscience sake, why the, the sake of the someone who informed you? Well, first, they might be in worship of this idol, and now you can show them and say, yeah, I understand what you think it means, but I don't want to partake in this. I'm a Christian. We're separated from these things. And also, if the person who's telling you this is somebody who is, um, like, their conscience is seared against them, or a friend of yours, a fellow believer, and they're like, whoa, hold on, this was sacrificed to that God? You don't want that. Then you definitely can't eat it, because it's something that would violate their conscience. I do not mean your own conscience, this is what he's going to, but for the other persons. For why is my freedom, my Christian liberty, judged by someone else's conscience? If I partake with gratefulness, well, why am I slandered concerning that for which I give thanks? Uh, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to Jews or to Greeks, that's Gentiles, right? Or to the church of God. Just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of the many, so that they may be saved. And that is all the notes, and that is all the reading for today. So, God willing, we'll be back tomorrow. Behold, the word of the Lord.